Hey there, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. I'm Jessica Honiger, founder of the world-changing brand Noonday Collection, and I'm so glad to have you here for today's conversation. Our Going Scared community gathers here every week for direct and honest conversations that help you live a life of courage by leaving comfort and going scared. I am excited to kick off today's brand new series that we are calling Habits for Highly Hesitant Habit Keepers. They say that of the 41% of Americans who make New Year's resolutions, only 9% are successful in keeping them. We specifically are launching this mid-February because I'm assuming some of you might have started off the year with some high aspirations and maybe you're having some trouble by now in staying true to those original intentions. Well, guys, I have needed a good reframe with my relationship to habits. Especially last year, I found myself fatigued, exhausted by the end of the year, and was kind of ditching some of those regular good practices that I like. I knew that someone that was gonna help me reframe and get remoted about habits would be Gretchen Rubin. Gretchen Rubin is our guest for today. She has been a guest on The Oprah Show. The New York Times has called her the queen of the self-help memoir, and she has even been an answer on the game show Jeopardy. Now, that's goals. We are really excited to dive in to today to really talk about what are habits and why should we even care? Why do they even matter? And then over the course of the next few weeks, we are going to be talking about very specific habits that maybe some of us aspire to. Things like meal planning and movement and actually going to the dentist and making our doctor's appointments. We even have a special episode we're planning about our Enneagram number and its relationship to habits. And that's what I really love about Gretchen is she really does break down how your personality might interact with habits. And it's just extremely, extremely helpful. I'm excited for you to dive into today's conversation with Gretchen Rubin. So I did an Instagram poll towards the end of last year, towards the end of our last series, which was all about knowing yourself. And I put it out there. What do you guys want to hear from me next about? Do you want to hear entrepreneurial success stories post-pandemic? Do you want to learn about digital health? And then I hesitantly put on the poll, do you want to learn how to keep habits? And it won. Uh, I'm not surprised. It won, but I was sort of annoyed (laughs) because I was thinking, why do people want to talk about habits? And then because we're in the middle of a self-awareness series, I thought, why am I annoyed by that? Mm. And I realized it's because I'm tired. I'm really tired. I am one of those you know, during this, the last two years that has been leading through some really challenging seasons in our business, in our family with teenagers, and I'm fatigued. And I equate most habits with spending energy. Mm -hmm. But then I remembered what you have taught me through all of your books is that once a habit is established, it actually requires less energy. Exactly. Yes. So I was like, okay, but it doesn't take energy for me to make my coffee in the morning or buckle my seatbelt or get on my daily 8.40 a.m. call with our leadership team. So I have that, you know, aspiration of I know once something is in place, it actually creates more energy for me. And that is motivating. But how do you start a new habit when you're tired? So that is what led me to this new podcast series. And the truth is, even though I married the most habitual person I've ever met in my life, except maybe you, (laughs) (laughs) we are all hesitant around certain habits. Even my husband, who is so habitual, he's not in the habit of going to doctor visits. And he's not in the habit of keeping up with his eyes and his contacts and his, you know, I don't know when the last time he got new glasses was. So we're going to be covering so many habits in this series. We're going to be talking about the habit of meal planning, moving our bodies, paying attention, digital health, decluttering, and more. 
And I think for me, what requires energy and makes me tired is the idea of starting something. Mm -hmm. That's the issue for me. So I Mm -hmm. have gotten out of some habits over the last couple of years. I realize, oh, those habits are good for me and I need to start, but I'm tired. So I want to just begin there. But before that, actually, I did want to ask you, how do you define a habit? A habit is a practice or behavior that you do without having to think about it. So as you said, part of why they are energizing and freeing is you don't have decision fatigue. Uh, You're not wrestling with your self-control. It just, you just snap on your seatbelt or you just um, take your daily medication right before you take your first cup of coffee and you do it just without delay and without a lot of like back and forth in your head, because that's very draining. Sometimes we'll go back and forth in our heads and in the end, never get around to doing it. We come up with a loophole to put it off and put it off. And at the end of the day, we're exhausted and we still haven't, you know, done a half an hour of yoga or whatever. But I also think like sometimes people use habit and ritual. To me, a ritual is a, is a habit or practice that has like a deeper significance. So like if you're saying a prayer while you're brushing your teeth, well, then that's a ritual. But if you're just brushing your teeth and thinking about what's on your to-do list for the next day, I would just call that a habit. So I think rituals are, are more elevated. Um, and sometimes um, habits can be strengthened by becoming rituals, um, but they don't have to become rituals in order to be strong. I really like that distinction. I think that matters. I think that you could have ideas of, okay, what do I want to become habitual? And then what do I want to be ritual? Like give it, like saying thanks before you have a meal or like I have like a gratitude. I say like thanks every time I come and go from my apartment building. I've kind of these funny doors that I have to get through. And so it's a good reminder to be like, I'm so happy to be coming home or I'm so happy to be going out, you know? Um, so that's a ritual. But uh, just putting my keys back at the same place every day, that would just be a habit. Okay. So you've researched and discovered four tendencies that we each fall into. And yes. I know I have taken that quiz on your website. How many people have taken that at this point? More than three and a half million people oh have taken gosh. it. Yes. It's free. It's quick. <laughs> Go to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies and find out your tendency. Wow. That is a lot of data. That yeah. is so much data. Okay. I want you to describe those tendencies. And then I want you, first of all, to tell me what you've learned from the data, because that's crazy. And then I want to know how each of those tendencies interacts with habits. Yes. So the four tendencies is a framework that it's a personality framework that I figured out because um, when I was studying habits to write my book better than before, which is all about the 21 strategies of habit change, um, I began noticing a pattern about how certain people did or didn't find success in in forming habits. And I was very puzzled by this and, and intrigued and trying to figure out what was going on. And the most important moment was when a friend of mine said, because my sister, my sister Alyssa says I can be kind of a happiness bully, um, because if I think there's a way for you to be happier, I can kind of get like all intense. And um, so I was asking this friend about how she, you know, what she was doing to be happier. And she said something that just hit me like a lightning bolt. She said, the funny thing about me is I know I'm happier when I exercise. And when I was in high school on the track team, I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now on my own? And I thought, well, why? It's the same person. It's the same behavior. At one time, it was effortless. Now she's struggling. How do you explain that? Now, I can generate like 10 theories in my head, but what's really the issue? And then I noticed other patterns, like um, whenever I would talk to people about New Year's resolutions, that's kind of a good way to start people talking about their aims and their resolutions and their habits. A certain group of people would say exactly the same thing to me. They would say, I would not keep a New Year's resolution on January 1st because January 1st is an arbitrary date. I would keep a resolution whenever it made sense to me. And I thought, well, that's very striking because the arbitrariness of January 1st never bothered me. But to these people, they all use that word arbitrary. And for them, it's like very off-putting. So what's going on? Mm -hmm. So huge amount of like intellectual, like just sweat pouring down my face for months and months. And finally, I realized that the key was the idea of expectations. It's how we either meet expectations or resist expectations. So this is how we, you know if you're an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. Those are the four tendencies. So upholders readily meet 
outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. And for the record, that's what you are. That's what I am. Yes. And so our motto, the Upholder motto is discipline is my freedom. I believe that with all my heart. Then there you are and my cl- husband. You and my husband. I was, when you were describing Both him, good I'm like, West, mm. good Midwestern folk. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not really related to where you, where, what part of the country you're from. But uh, so then, um, then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. They resist anything arbitrary, like January 1st, anything inefficient, unjustified. So they're essentially making everything an inner expectation. If it meets their inner standard, they'll do it no problem. If it fails their inner standard, they will push back. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. They tend to like things very personalized. They need a lot of justification. Mm, this is so me. That's totally me. Is that you? That's what my husband is, is yeah. Westerner. Then it's there exhausting. are obliger. Yo, we can talk about analysis paralysis if you want. Um, So then there are obligers. And this is the biggest tendency for both men and women. You either are an obliger or you have many obligers in your life. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. To meet an inner expectation, they must have a form of outer accountability. If you want to read more, join a book group. If you want to exercise, you need outer accountability. So this explains my friend on the track team. When she had a team and a coach expecting her to show up, she showed up no problem. But when she was trying to go on her own, it was a struggle. So she could have signed up for a class. She could have worked out with a trainer. She could have worked out with a friend who would have been disappointed if she didn't show up. There's a lot of ways to create outer accountability once you realize that that is the crucial thing. So the obligers motto is you can count on me and I'm counting on you to count on me. Mm. And then finally rebels. This is the smallest group. It's a conspicuous group, but it's a small group. And rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do, anything they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically, they don't tell themselves what to do. Like, they don't decide, oh, I'm going to give up bread. Because then they're like, no one tells me what to do, not even me. They don't sign up for a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturdays because they think, I don't know what I'm going to feel like doing on Saturday. And just the idea that someone's expecting me to show up is going to annoy me. So their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. (laughs) So you think you're a questioner? I do. Okay. Yes. Well, that's the second largest. Obliger is the, the largest. Word arbitrary all the time. Yeah. So tell that me is about a tell. Tell that me, is a tell. It's a tell tell side. questioner. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about the data. Three and a half million people later. Okay. But questioners will say to me, hey, Gretchen, what about selection bias? And I would say, hey, questioners, I hear you on selection bias. So I paid for a national survey that did that, like, had, you know, the, the you know, uh, looked at enough people distributed among demographic groups, et cetera, to give me, like, the actual uh, breakdown. Real uh, breakdown. Yeah. 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 Because you could say, well, but Gretchen, all your, you know, you tend to have a lot of upholders in your group because you're an upholder, whatever. So you, I really had to pay to have a, a, a scientifically authoritative uh, survey done. So that's where I get the numbers that oblige. But I think, you know, you see it in the world around us. I mean, mm. we see that there are a lot of obligers. We hear from a lot of obligers. Um, and we, like I knew is this was one of the things that puzzled me when, when I wrote the happiness project, a lot of people would say to me, but how did you get yourself to do all those things? And I said, well, I just, I thought they would make me happier. So I decided to try them. And if they made me happier, I just kept it up. Mm -hmm. And they would look at me very puzzled and they'd say, yeah, but how did you get yourself to do it? And it's like, I I don't really understand what you're asking. So I began to understand that there was something about me that was different from a lot of other people. And that Mm -hmm. was part of also what got me interested in habit formation. I'm a questioner, but I also have to force myself. Like once I actually believe in something, I'm not like you and that I can just do it. I do have to put in. And I, um, we had a guest on the show once. His name is Benjamin Hardy, and he wrote a book called Willpower Doesn't Work. And it's all about creating environments for your success. Yes. So I have to do group workouts. So even though I believe in exercise, I'm not questioning that. It does make me feel better. Like that's said and done. Left to my own devices, if I was just like, well, I'm just going to go run on my own, I won't do it. So I do mm. have to have that outward commitment. Mm. Is that true generally? 
Yeah, it kind of is. Then I think you're an obliger. Really? Because remember, this has nothing to do with how curious you are, how analytical you are, how adventurous you are, how extroverted you are. It has nothing to do with anything except if somebody asks or tells you to do something, how do you I, respond? I question it. And if it. you say, I need outer accountability in order to meet an inner expectation, that is the definition of an obliger. No know. matter how like full of questions and loving of information you might be. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I have to think about that. I have to think about that. So in relationship to starting a habit, because I think that's where I got tired. I was just, and I realized later that's I how I formed. I have to say feeling tired is a sign of obliger. If okay. you feel like I need more time for self-care, I'm not good at drawing boundaries. Why do I keep my promises to other people, but I struggle to keep my promises to myself? Um, I don't. I don't. All of those oh. things are not true about me. Okay. Interesting. Uh -uh. Okay. I won't have to dig a little deeper uh -huh. on you. Uh -huh. No, I'm – no. I think I'm tired because I've just been leading a very challenging – in a challenging business environment. Well, then maybe as a question or you're sort of like, you know what? I know I should do these things, but deep down, I haven't really – I don't really think that's my – I don't really think that that's my priority right now. I feel like I need yeah. to preserve my energy. And so that's yeah, I'm kind of paying lip is. service to this thing, but I haven't really decided because for for when when questioners get like stuck or paralyzed, it's usually because deep down they haven't truly accepted that something's the right way or the best way that's or customized 100%. to them. That's a hundred percent. I mean, mm. yes. It is like I have to like experience it in my soul. <laughs> yeah. That's very questioner. And then I go for it, but I set myself up for success because I want to stay with things. I don't just want to start things. You know, I'm not just a starter. So I am curious that if you do feel overwhelmed, I mean, I think you kind of just answered it. I want to know for, because each person has a different relationship with starting a habit. So what is the first step that each of those people can take for actually beginning so if it's an obliger, it's very clear. And in, in, in a way, it, it, like for an obliger, it's the most straightforward. It's like get a c outer accountability. And there are so many ways to create outer accountability. And I think this is because there are so many obligers in the world. They know they need it. And so whether that's like texting a friend every time you do something or thinking about your duty to be a role model for someone else or uh, thinking about your duty to your future self, that works for some obligers. I will say that for some, like, they're very different in what kinds of accountability work for them. So like some obligers are very, feel very accountable if they spend money. Like if they, if they pay for a class, they're going to go. Other obligers, it's almost like that makes them feel like they're off the hook. I talked to one obliger. She's like, yeah, I signed up for a trainer because I knew I needed outer accountability. But then it occurred to me that if I skip a session, he still gets paid and he gets the time back. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me jump in and say that's not working. So you want it, you may need to do some experimentation for some people like an app, a notification for an app would be enough or like checking off a don't break the chain um, might be enough accountability. And for others, it needs to be an actual person. So you may need to um, experiment, but, um, but there's many ways to create outer accountability. And that's what obligers need. Not motivation, not clarity, not self-care, not putting themselves first. They need outer accountability and then they follow through. Questioners need reasons. If they're going to follow the advice of an expert, they have to believe that that expert truly knows what they're talking about. Um, they have to believe that whatever they're facing is the best way and the right way for them. And this can be tricky because of analysis paralysis. The questioners, sometimes their desire for perfect information can make it hard for them to make a decision or move forward. So like, let's say you want to eat more healthfully and you're a questioner. Well, there's so much information, a lot of it conflicting about how to eat more healthfully. So they could kind of like stall out because they haven't figured out truly in their heart what is the best way. But once they decide that, then they can, uh, usually they just can bite in and start and and go. Mm -hmm. um, so for questioners, it's really about having that knowledge and having that, that certainty, um, that clarity. The clarity is what is most important for questioners. I feel like we might come off as a little bit stubborn, the questioners. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And maybe well, a bit and, cynical. 
Well, questioner, well, questioner children often have the problem of seeming disrespectful because teachers are like, why are you questioning me? You know, like, it's kind of like, I'm the teacher. You do what I say. And to a questioner, even like a questioner eight-year-old, they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Right. Like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to write this book report. You know, I read the book. Why do I, I, this is like, why do I have to do this dumb assignment? So, the, yeah. So questioners can often have to learn to ask questions in a way that don't make other people feel defensive or, or like their authority is being undermined. That's a, that's a very common issue for questioners, adults and children alike. Then for rebels, rebels, it's interesting. They can do anything they want to do. So for a rebel, a lot of the advice that you give to other tendencies doesn't work for them and can actually be counterproductive. So something like sign up for a class and go every week. That's not going to work for a rebel, right? Because they tend to really love. Now, I would never say never because rebels come in all shapes and sizes. And sometimes they love a challenge. Like, I'm not going to drink for a year. Watch me. That kind of thing. And then they, then they're unstoppable. They tend not to like feeling trapped in a schedule. So they might do something better. Like I'm going to join a big gym that has got tons of options. And today I'm doing yoga and tomorrow I'm doing cardio and I'm doing whatever I want or, and for them also, um, thinking about their identity. It's the kind mm. of person that I am. Mm. It's that my values in the world I'm exercising, not because my doctor told me to, not even because I said I would, I'm exercising because I'm an athlete. I'm somebody who respects my body. I love the feeling of being outside. Maybe I'm going to go for a run during my lunch hour when I'm supposed to be working because no one is the boss of me. Getting tied in, you know, I love uh, I love healthy, fresh food. I love experimenting with new recipes. I like going to farmer's market. I eat this healthy way because this is what I like. This is what I choose. Mm. This is the kind of person that I am. Um, not this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you said you'd do. This is what everybody expects you to do. Um, those kinds of messages can can be very counterproductive, actually, for rebels. And then uh, for upholders, basically, upholders uh, are pretty good at this. Like, this is one of our superpowers as upholders is forming habits. We tend to, like, form them easily and kind of get a kick out of them. And what's funny is the upholder is a very small tendency. I would say that we are very disproportionately represented in the, the um, ranks of people who want to suggest to others how, about how to form their habits. <laughs> and sometimes I say, I say to my, you know, my, 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 uh, my, my colleagues in habit formation, I'm like, yeah, but you're an upholder and anything works for you. All tools work for you because upholders, like this is the way we're wired. Right. It's not that you have some like magic system. It's like any system would work for totally. you. Totally. Yeah. It blows my mind. It just being married to one, it just yes. honestly blows my mind. And I get so bored. I get so bored with certain habits. And he just it just doesn't they're at energizing. All. They're energizing. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I wanted to ask you as a person in the what did you just call it? The habit space. Yeah, the habit formation. Yeah. Habit formation. Yeah. Because yeah. I was surprised to hear that I think Atomic Habits, which came out a while ago, was one of the top selling books last year. I, that just surprised me. I don't know. I think it's because I'm a questioner. And so I'm like, aren't you guys just, I'm just feeling rebellious about habits right now. Mm. So when I think about collectively new habits that we might have established over the last two years that actually need to be broken. What would you say to that? Absolutely. And it's interesting because this period has hit people differently because, and, and often for good and for ill in the same person, because habits were very disrupted, existing habits. And for some people that was positive, like I'm cooking all these healthy meals because I don't have a commute. And then for some people it was very negative. Like I stopped going to the gym because I always like dropped off my kid at the, you know, at school. And then I went to the gym and then I went to work. And now that I'm not doing that, I haven't been going to the gym. And so there have been, for a lot of people, habits that had to be um, reshaped. And one thing that I haven't seen people talking about, but that I think is going to be a big issue, is that from childhood, all of us were trained five on, two off. The weekday is the weekend. And a lot of people have habits that are like weekday habits and then are weekend habits. And I think it's going to be harder for people to form habits when it's like, Sometimes I go in on Monday and sometimes I work from home and sometimes I go in at 11 and sometimes I go in at 9 a.m. And it's like, okay, that because habits, you said this earlier, habits form more easily when they're repeated in a very predictable, consistent way. And the more predictable and consistent, kind of the more effortless and thoughtless in a good way they become. 
And I think this is going to mean that people are going to have to be much more intentional with their habits. And that can be hard when you want to just like stick something into automatic pilot and walk away. It might be harder now if there's less regularity in our schedules. That's true. And I do think the regularity, irregularity is here to stay. Yeah. What other sort of habits like collectively, like I'm even thinking about, I feel I've, I've coined this term that people have gotten to the habit of hermiting, that even though they could go out and actually, you know, connect with people in a safe way, they've just kind of gotten so used to just being at home and not actually going out and connecting with people. I kind of think it's too soon to see for that. I think there's still, I think there's enough ambiguity um, about that that I wonder what we're going to see when the clouds truly lift. Okay. You think we're going to swing back into just craving togetherness again? I, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't think, I don't think we can go by now because I think that I don't, I don't, I'm, at least to my, to my mind, it, it doesn't feel like it's truly behind us. No, Del, that's like, hey, sure. hey, you're hang in... out. Come over, hang right. out. Let's all get together. Like, come on, come into my house. Well, you're in New York, people. aren't you? Yeah, I'm in yeah, New York. Yeah. People are people are people are cautious. You know, they don't want to get ahead of themselves. Um and, and and there's a lot of uncertainty and it kind of like there's sort of waves of uncertainty. So now I think people are sort of like I don't want to make a lot of plans. You know, I'm kind of kind of so but I agree that we're going to have to get back into it. I just I just feel like we don't exactly yet know what that's going to look like. And maybe that brings me to this series because I feel like we're still a little bit, I call it like no man's land, like we're on an inter- long international flight. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know when you're yeah. on a long but international we don't flight? Know what ta- we don't know when we're supposed to land. You don't know when it's going to land. You don't know what time it is. You're like the lights are on, but the but it's dark outside. Yeah. I think that I think people, if you had given people a deadline, whatever that deadline was and how how preposterous it might have seemed at the beginning. If you're like, by this date, these these things will be true. People can pace themselves. I think it's the uncertainty. I think it's being in that flight and not knowing, when's this thing, get, like, do I have time to start a movie? Right. Can I watch the entire Game of Thrones, like, right now? <laughs> because right. I'll do that if you tell me I'm going to be up here for 90 hours. You right, know, I can, right. I'll, I can might make up my mind. I think it's, I think it's the deadline. And then I think it's sort of like making up your mind that it's a deadline. And then somebody's like, ooh, switcheroo. Yeah. It's kind of not really a deadline. Or you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard. I think well, it's navigating everybody else's yes. kind of, but that's, what's been really hard for me. Yes. Whew. Navigating other people's boundaries and expectations and wanting to honor them, but yes. then, yeah. but you know, one thing, um, because you're so drained and, and, and like kind of loath to start a new habit because it feels so demanding. Maybe you need to give yourself some habits that are about fun or whimsy or rest. Yeah. Like, um, so I have a podcast happier with Gretchen Rubin and every, for the last three years, we've done like a challenge for ourselves and for listeners. So, um, in 2020 it was walk for 20 minutes a day in 2020. So we challenged people like walk 20 and 20. Okay. That turned out to be a really good yeah. <laughs> challenge for you 2020. You can actually do that for the whole we, year. <laughs> we didn't know that, but a lot of people were like, Oh, this really saved me. Then for 2021, we were like, look, 2020 was not a great year. 2021, we're going to have a delightful challenge. And so the challenge was to read 21. It's like, read anything you want. Listening counts, like read 21. And people loved it, right? Because people wanted to be reminded to read. And then we come to 2022 and we're like, okay, well, 21 didn't exactly go the way we thought it would go. What do people need in 2022? And we picked rest. So the mm. challenge for 2022 is to rest 22 and 22, whether that's going to bed 22 minutes earlier or napping. I started with the habit of napping, which I'm a, I can get, I love that. Even a, mm. like a 22 minute nap for me is the perfect length or just like my sister lies. She's a TV showrunner, So she's crazy. Bu- you know, she's, she's mm-hmm. super busy and she lies in bed and listens to an audiobook. And for mm. her, that's very, very restful. Or, you know, you could sit outside I and watch your that. dog play in the backyard while you drink a cup of coffee in the morning. But I think just sort of reminding people you need a habit of rest, just like you need a habit of exercising or meditating or learning Spanish or whatever it is that you have put on your list. 
like make time for fun, make a habit of things that you enjoy and look forward to. And also maybe if what you really need is more rest. And true rest. You know, true I think people rest. are like, oh, well, I'm just sitting on my scout, my couch scrolling my Instagram. Ooh, is that rest? Is I that rest? I don't think that's rest. No, I don't either. Elizabeth and I talked about that because she because we were like, could walking be rest? And we were yes. like, could it? Okay, that's see, the, everybody's going to have to like come up with their own definition because walking I to think, notice, putting your path in oncoming beauty, like walking your neighborhood to notice. I think rest comes from awareness, from being present, and from noticing the beauty that surrounds us. So I think going on a walk to like exercise and get your steps in, that sounds awful. That's not restful. <laughs> But you're probably one of those that, like, could only walk if it's getting your steps in. No, I'm a huge fan of just meandering. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Like, one of the things I do is I go to the Metropolitan Museum every day. I live very near the Met, and I go every day. And I do that. I just – I don't have an agenda. I just walk around, just look at stuff. Ugh. That is so good. Yeah. And it is – it is restful. So I think for some people that can be rest. I think for some people – but, like – I would say it is not restful to scroll or even to watch TV. I don't. I, don't, I agree I don't with you. Feel like that's restful, even though you're not in motion. And yet, I think listening to an audiobook does seem like rest. so. I think it's. I think that like like there's no there's no right answer. There's no right way to do this. I think whatever is restful for you. Like I could imagine someone like flipping through art books, like somebody who's very visually mm-hmm. oriented. Mm-hmm. But then for someone else, they're like, oh, I'm a graphic designer. If I'm looking at right. it, like, my mind is constantly like noticing and planning and making notes and being like, ooh, look what they did with that angle. And it's like, that's not restful. It's fun. It's It might be fascinating. It might be pleasurable. But is it restful? Maybe not. Like, so e- for each of us, I think we would have to think about what you said, true rest. Like even just that phrase, it sounds mm. so enticing, so it is. refreshing. It is enticing. Although as a questioner, don't sit around and ask yourself all year what rest is for you. <laughs> right, right. No, good point. <laughs> Come up with it. <laughs> right. Commit. Well, th- this is one thing that questioners can remind themselves. This is a really good point. Is that questioners can, re- if they're feeling that analysis paralysis, they can say, look, Better to get it going than to get it perfect. I can start, and if something doesn't work for me, I've learned. I've I can pivot. I can consider this an experiment. If this works, then I've learned something. But I can succeed by failing. If I find that you know walking around my neighborhood, I don't find restful. Maybe I need to experiment with a nap. That is fine. You're still doing your 22 and 22. You found that something that worked for somebody else doesn't work that well for you. That is success because that's knowing yourself, as you as you have said. You know, knowing yourself is a really important value, and sometimes you just have to experiment on your experiment on yourself and try something because it's not like there's a magic answer. There's no magic one size fits all solution. No one can tell you, and maybe you can't even figure it out for yourself until you give it a shot. And so, you know, try something, test it out. Maybe have like a uh, like a one sentence journal. I'm a big like I created this one sentence journal um, notebook. And you could just like write it down. What it, what have you learned about yourself? This was really refreshing. This wasn't that refreshing. I wonder with some people with rest, are they going to ruminate with that time? Like, are they going to have to think about, ooh, my mm-hmm. mind goes to a bad place. How am I going to rest in a way? Like, can I schedule time to worry mm-hmm. so that I'm not using this time? Because am I am I just like working myself up? Right. I, you know, that could be an issue for somebody. I'm just wondering about that. We'll see. Yeah. So I think sometimes questioners have to just consider everything, you know, they tend to like to like hack themselves, right? you know, and test things out, get data on themselves, personalize. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Gosh, I love that you're doing this. You know, it's interesting because in some ways we've slowed down the last two years. Like there's this perception that we've slowed down, but then in other ways we've sped up. And I do know that we have spent way too much time on technology. And I know for me, I used to have the habit of leaving my computer and my phone in my car when I would get home from the office. Ooh, wow. That's bold. It was bold. I had little children at the time. And so I think I was able as a questioner to really identify that like, well, I don't want my kids to see me just home and scrolling. Now I have teenagers and one of them has a phone, you know, so now they're a little bit more... 
I have not been committed to that anymore. Like it, well, also I don't go into the office that often anymore. Yeah, so. I mean, you're right. It's just, it's, it's, you, that habit doesn't work. It doesn't achieve its purpose. It's kind of washed away. It it's doesn't washed even, away. It doesn't even really make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't even. I would have to go a, walk a out to my car to like yeah. make it inaccessible to me. So yeah. yeah, but I do, I do think there are some, but I let, I'm reframed now. Thank you. I am reframed. I am now happy officially that we are doing this podcast series. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Like think of a, like a habit that would be refreshing and think about, you know, all the ways that I could cement that into my life. So good. And, and another thing that we do on happier, um, is to do like a 22 for 22 list where you think of 22 things you want to do in 22. And, and some people do only fun things like 22 hikes I want to go on or like 22 places in my hometown that I want to visit. Or like, I'm going to do a thing where I'm going to delegate 22 things because I'm really bad at delegating. Ooh, I love that. Right. And so they can be things like get a will, which my sister has put on her list, her yearly list for several years. Now she's finally doing it, but you know, that's big and arduous and hard, but important. Um, and then you could have things like her favorite show is Mad Men and I had never seen it. And she kept saying to me, you've got to watch it. You've got to watch it. But it's a lot of TV to watch, to like sit down and watch that. But I, but I knew I would love it. And of course I did once yeah. I started. And so that was a fun thing to put on the list. That is fun. This is, oh, this has got yeah. me energized. I did not expect this. Or you like, just got me energized. Good. Yay. No, see, as an upholder, of course, I think habits are like so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And there's a question you're like, why would I form a habit? Like, yeah. Why would why does that make sense? It's oh like, yeah. Literally one of my questions that we don't have to answer is like, why does any of this matter? Like that's on my <laughs> Well, why I'll tell you habits that matter. <laughs> Look, I mean, habits research shows that habits are about forty percent of everyday life is governed by habit. So if we have habits that work for us, we're just a lot more likely to be happier, healthier, more productive, and more creative. And if we have habits that don't work for us, it's gonna be harder. But forty percent is a lot of your day. You just sold me again, Gretchen. Good. There you go. I'm so glad you're kicking this off. (laughs) If you needed a little bit of revisioning, re-motivation, then this conversation was absolutely perfect for me. I happened to interview her on a day when I was feeling a little bit cynical and like, ugh, I just don't have it in me to start some things. And I left this conversation ready to take on the world. So I hope it did that for you as well. We want to kick this series off with some giveaways because we would love for you to share this series. It's going to be chock full of so much practical, helpful information and just conversations with people that you are going to want to hear from. So to kick it off, I am giving away some of my favorite pieces from our new Noonday collection. Some layering pieces for your neck, even an ear party, some arm party pieces. All you gotta do is share the episode. So give it a screenshot and share it either on Instagram or if you hang out on Facebook, share a link of the episode. Tag Jessica Honiger and we will pick a few winners because we wanna kick this off with a big, big boom. Thanks so much for coming back. I know it was a long wait, but I'm telling you, this series is absolutely worth the wait. Music from today's show is by Ellie Holcomb, and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.